maybe it would be nice uh, just at the beginning for uh, everybody to sort of uh, introduce themselves uh, so people in case people don't know who you are. Um, uh, I am T. Cole Rachel. I'm the senior editor at the Creative Independent. Who wants to go next? I'll go. I'm Sarah Sane, owner of Pies and Thighs. I'm Agatha Kulaga, owner and co-founder, CEO of Ovenly. Well, normally when we would be doing a TCI conversation with creators, um, we're always talking to people about their process and how they do what they do and how they got started and a little bit about, you know, uh, the creative aspect of their work, uh, all of which, you know, has been thrown into chaos for everybody across every industry. Um, at the moment, um, all creatives, you know, are sort of scrambling to figure out how to do their work if they can do their work. Uh, people that have businesses obviously are scrambling to figure out how they can save their business or keep their business going. Um, the two of you sort of uh, represent two kind of different models of a food-based business operation. So I guess I, it would be nice just for each of you to have a, have a moment to sort of tell your story of like how you uh, initially responded to uh, the pandemic and like what that process looks like for you now ongoing. And I know for Agatha, there was recently this very beautiful New York Times story that sort of broke a lot of this down. Um, but I'm curious, I mean, you, you had a very large operation that you sort of had to figure out how to, how to, <laughs> how to handle. So yeah. I, can, I mean, what was, um, what was that process like, I guess, and how did it sort of break down in real time? So we were we started monitoring our sales the week before March 16th, and um, and at that point was when I put a spending freeze across the company because I knew that things were going to start getting worse, and so it was really to uh, preserve our cash and monitor what was happening from a safety uh, from a safety issue, but also just in terms of preparing to possibly shut down, you know, in the next week or so. And what I saw was that with our wholesale clients, the, the businesses that were around schools and universities were the first to really be impacted by it because those were shutting down. And, and so our sales started to drop at those locations. And that's when I realized that this was going to be, you know, a much bigger deal. And so we started monitoring uh, sales in our stores from that moment. And what was interesting was that the, the sales didn't flatten at all. And then um, at the end of that week, the state put, uh, they set a mandate to reduce capacity in restaurants by 50%. And I went in that weekend to Ovenly, which is around the corner uh, for me in Greenpoint. And so I removed all the tables and left a few stools and then went back a few hours later and my staff had actually moved the stools and put them back in, into the kitchen. And that was the first sign to me that my staff was also feeling uncomfortable in our spaces. And, and that's when I made the decision to have a meeting with my, my management and administrative team on Monday to, um, to have a discussion about what it looked like to start closing down sooner than later. And on March 16th, we met and, you know, I wanted it to be a collaborative decision. I wanted it to, um, to, to be a conversation and not just we're shutting down, you know, and this is, this is it. And so we came to that decision together and we felt, uh, you know, for the safety of our staff and our customers and, and really to preserve our cash so that, after we closed, we could have money to reopen when, you know, when this was all over. And so that day we decided to shut down all of our operations temporarily, of course, but, you know, we're still shut down today. Yeah. Uh, and how was it for Pies and Thighs? Um, we made small incremental changes over sort of a long period of time. There was maybe the week or two before um, it, the, there was the mandate that only essential businesses could be open and so, sort of trickling down different steps that we could take. Um, but I, on March 10th, 9th, I think, my son came home from school sick. And I had already been, you know, like you're following the nurses on Twitter that are saying like, this is coming and be careful. and going to be bad and so when he came home sick I was sort of like we're going to treat this as if he's sick sick 
So he quarantined in our house. My, me and my other son and my husband didn't leave the house for two weeks. And so I was trying to manage it from there. But it, we just treated the restaurant as if that was something that was happening in the city. We did our best to. So that people were walking around, people were sick. And so we initially started doing contact-free delivery and pickup. And it was bumpy, you know, it was, it's a really steep learning curve for people to go from everything being fine to everything being scary. So a lot of people didn't want to, didn't, you know, sort of were late to that. People were frustrated that it was, that they couldn't sit with their party of eight for brunch. And we're going like, no, it's like, I know it feels like a last hurrah to people, but like this, we have to wind this down. So before, and, you know, Cuomo or de Blasio made the call, like we said, we're just going to pick up and delivery because it was, it felt like out of our control in a way that like even with half the tables, it was still, it felt too crowded, it felt unsafe. So we basically just like blocked our front door with tables and people opened the door and grab their food. Um, and that has worked pretty well. We have sanitizer out there for them. Our staff all wear masks and we have all this, um, you know, we have like a war chest of homemade sanitizer that we accidentally a long time ago placed in order for way too much of like alcohol. And so now we're working our way through it. Mm. Um, but so when we're here, it feels, it feels safe. It feels like, you know, the people that are working want to be working. They want as many hours as they can get because all of us are scared for our futures and we don't, you know, there's no certainty in how long it will last. Um, and so for, we've been pretty stable in that setup for maybe the last, I don't know, five weeks or a month maybe. Um, and in that time we also, you know, our sales have declined so much because we are like a, you know, we have 65 seats people on the weekends we're full and we're turning tables quickly and so it's a really different thing to just have a kitchen and three empty dining rooms and have as many delivery riders coming and going as we can. Um, so we, you know, a lot of staff are here working for us and we've tried to sort of like spread hours among all the people that want to work so that um, we're not just like concentrating it on a few people, the people that need in there so we can have more people that have a little bit of income coming in. Um, and then we have, you know, a lot of our other employees or students or sort of on the younger side and went home, whether that's in state or out of state and, um, you know, or have filed for unemployment from there. So I don't, ha I feel fortunate to not have like a large staff of people that I can't support, you know, and I'm, and thankfully the, you know, uh, the people that, as far as I can tell, that applied for unemployment are getting it. Um, but it doesn't feel, it, from my perspective, it doesn't feel like there are people that are in need from us and we can't help them. Sarah, you guys were set up with delivery and takeout from the start where for oh. us, yeah, our, our business really was the in-store retail experience and, you know, coming in, but people would, it's like grab and go more so. And delivery for us was really based on big catering orders because obviously pastries are, you know, it's an add on to a meal generally. Um, so it was really hard for us to, it's, you know, it, that was such a small part of our business that it's much harder to just, you know, pivot and do that when people are not going to be ordering just like, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to, to send a delivery driver to deliver three scones and a cookie. Right. So, yeah. so that just makes it harder because the, um, the, the cost of that, that overhead and, and actually the sales that would happen would not make sense for us. And it's a total, ours is a totally different model because taking that 20 to 30% off of every single order is a huge cut and that every single order goes in a disposable box and is in a bag. You know, there's so many additional costs that yeah. might not occur to you as a diner. Um, but for us, it's the, our breakdown of where our money goes right now is completely different than it was two months ago. Yeah. Where are your sales at Sarah right now? Uh, we're at about 50% of where we were. I mean, that's, 
That's a great considering. I know people that are operating and are at their like 20 or 30%. So that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah. And I think what you're saying is right. That part of it is that we have been with, you know, DoorDash and Seamless and we have like an in-house delivery. It's always been a big part of our business. So we're trying to just, um, you know, figure out it, how that business as its own thing works without the support of the restaurant around it. I mean, Sarah, you guys always also have this sort of interesting thing happening with doing the meals that are being delivered to various hospitals yeah. Yeah. Uh, and people can donate um, specifically for that. Mm -hmm. And I know from talking to uh, Carolyn, your partner, um, yeah. that was like a sort of thing that evolved really quickly and you sort of had to just sort of like think on your feet in order to make it happen. Like yeah. what, what is the, I guess, what is the status of that right now and how is it operating? It's good. I mean, it's good. It's, it, it's a whole other, you know, logistical, it's not a nightmare, but it's a, it's a lot of logistics to work out. And now looking back, I see like so many mistakes that I made when we started it, but basically we just, you know, posted that on our website, um, that people could buy chicken buckets for hospital workers and it did pretty well. And so we put this big delivery together. I couldn't figure out how to get in touch with someone at Woodhull. And so I just went down there and like walked in the urgent care with a food. I had a mask on gloves, everything. And I was absolutely terrified, but I walked in and they were there and they were, and they just called the lady upstairs and she was like, Oh, this is amazing. Oh, great. We'll take it. Can you do this Saturday and Sunday moving forward? And I was like, yes, I'm going to need a lot of buckets, but we can do this. So, um, basically people have been continued to donate buckets and we have a, you know, standing like order set up with them and we figured out how to deliver it. We figured out how they need to receive it, which is like individual meals packaged for individual people. They're not, we're so used to like wedding catering where you have, you know, the big line and you take a scoop of Mac and a little of this, but like, obviously now I know it's not happening in a hospital. You're, they're trying as hard as they can to be, um, super safe there. So everything is wrapped up. Um, we're delivering it with, you know, gloves and napkins and silverware for them. Um, and it's also been interesting. We're doing that and we're also doing this um, family. It's through uh, HeartShare St. Vincent's and they deliver like whole meals to families in need. So every Tuesday we have put together a hundred meals and that'll be like a whole chicken and couple quarts of sides and you know biscuits and a pie um and so that also is it takes it's it has like a, a similar ebb and flow of catering where we'll need you know maybe five people working on a monday and then on tuesday we need 10 people getting everything together in a matter of two hours and so there are times when i'm thinking like this is this is a lot of people moving really quickly and it's a lot of people in the restaurant and it'll feel like, I'm like, are we doing this right? And um, we're taking all the precautions that we can. So I hope that we are, but uh, I don't know. I think it, it, I guess I had a concern sort of after a couple of weeks of doing the buckets where I thought like, does anyone actually in the hospital actually need food? Is this, are we just like sort of spinning our wheels and it's good for our business and people want to be contributing, but is anything happening on the other end? Are they actually there being like, I need lunch? And as it's gone, it really has, I've learned that it, that they do need it and it is appreciated and, and they are in there working so hard for so long that having those little, you know, like moments of joy in their day that we're able to provide like you, it's been, it's, I've been like really touched it at their gratefulness for something that seems so small to us, you know? Mm. What has the volume of donations been so far? Like we have received a, uh, hang on, I have to do some quick math. Um, I think we've, well, we've delivered about 800 meals. So is yeah. that, is, so you're donating those? No, the, no. Oh, okay. Are, I was like, how are you managing that? With no, no, no. The, the St. Vincent's heart share is like nowhere near what, what it, we're not charging anywhere near what it would be retail. So 
that is, um, you know, it's sort of like we're, I'd say we don't, we're donating our time. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Um, yeah. And for the buckets, you know, part of the deal is like supporting the restaurant, keeping us able to keep our employees working. So that is at, um, you know, we, we charge what we would charge a customer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, one thing I wanted to ask, I don't, and I know both of you maybe have dealt with this in some capacity, but uh, Agatha, you were, able, you were able to break this down in a way that was very sensible to me talking about what a lot of people are dealing with is like trying to get loans, trying to figure out how to like deal with the system in terms of small business loans, or what is the, if you get a small business loan, what is the best way to use that money to keep yourself afloat for when you can reopen? Uh, and I know that has been, that's sort of like navigating this sort of labyrinth of insanity, but like, I guess in a sort of abbreviated way, like what has your experience been with that for your business? crazy it, i mean i think the the one thing is as most business owners can probably relate including ones that are operating like sarah i think you know i've been in survival mode from the day that i had to lay off all of my staff and i've been working in some ways more than i have the past five years because you know it really is about we've had this business for almost a decade and um, I am going to do everything possible to ensure that we're able to reopen and reunite our team and you know and it really is it feels like when I first started the business that's it feels very isolating and I'm working such long hours to now it's about applying for every loan and grant possible you know we're trying to navigate those systems and trying to speak with as many people as possible to understand you know what sh what we should be doing what we should be looking out for how we should be planning and you know that that goes from news outlets to um city council people to other business owners you know it's, it's just a constant hustle now but in a very different way um and navigating the loan process obviously has been a total shit show um and you know, more challenging for small businesses because while the government did mobilize to provide, you know, a large amount of funding to businesses, what ended up happening was that, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily planned properly and they scrambled to get this funding out there. But between the CARES Act being put together and the funding actually uh, being made available in that time frame in between, the economy changed so drastically and when the cares act was put together so many businesses were still operating it was before all the statewide mandates you know to shut down non-essential businesses happened and then when the funding was actually made available most businesses were either operating at a very small capacity or were already shut down so you know with the ppp loans that came out at that point, the rules for how to spend that money were so strict that it did not make sense for most businesses that were actually receiving that funding and most didn't even receive the funding. So, you know, it, the regulations around how to use it was around 75% being used toward payroll and, and regaining the, the same headcount of employees that you had before February 15th which if you do the math, it does not make sense, right? So for example, Ovenly had 67 employees, including myself. And the moment that you receive the funding, so the moment it hits your bank account, you have to use that for eight consecutive weeks and 75% has to be used on payroll. And you have to rehire the same amount of people. So I would right now have to rehire 66 people, pay them like similar wages, and we're not operating. And the point of this money for most businesses when they applied was to be able to reopen and somehow get through this public health crisis. And what we're now finding is that that money in order to be forgiven, it needs to be used on payroll. And if you're not operating, which most businesses are not, it does not make sense. And even if the businesses that are operating get that money, it's still impossible to get it forgiven because they're not operating at the capacity where you would need your full head to be able to do that so it only works for businesses really where you know their sales are 
quite similar, their headcount is the same, or people that are able to work from home, which is none of the food industry. So, you know, that's really where the challenge is for small businesses, but specifically for food businesses, it really is, you know, in some ways the loan program, while the government, you know, did a great job in terms of getting that money out, it went to businesses that were publicly traded rather than small businesses. And it's not saving anyone. And so, you know, we're hoping with this next round of funding that the rules around how to spend it will change and that it'll apply to that last round of funding. But right now, businesses were scrambling to apply. So many did not get any funding. And the ones that did are still scrambling now and faced with another hurdle to, to get through. And ultimately, if you do get that funding and it's not able to get be forgiven, the terms on that loan make no sense, right? So for us as a business, let's say we, we get that money and we're, we, we can't get it forgiven, which is impossible. We have two years to pay it off. For us, that amount is $410,000. And so in six months, you have to start paying it off. That amount would be just under $18,000 a month. When our sales are probably going to be at like I, you know, like in a perfect world at 40 to 50% when we reopen or, you know, as we ramp up and reopen, it's going to be impossible for us to pay back. So basically it puts us into debt that we were not going to be able to repay. And what, what does that look like for most businesses that, you know, we're already struggling before this happened. And so it's just the economics of it does not, it just does not make any sense for food businesses at this point. Yeah, that's been something like uh, a lot of people have talked about the having to make the decision to let people go so that they could at least try and get unemployment yeah. uh, and use whatever money they could get access to to at least keep hold of their spaces, which we're not going to forgive their rent right. uh, until they can open for business again. And it's a very hard choice to have to make um, for anybody. It is. It's the, the eight week getting back up to full pay. Like we, we start on a pretty good footing considering that we're open and we have money coming in and we have some staff and still for us to be able to get up to where we were before this in eight weeks, considering the climate of New York, that people aren't going out to eat, that we wouldn't have the chances of us having open dining rooms and that being safe in eight weeks, I think is close to zero. So how, how do I turn my business of delivery and pickup into a, you know, a mammoth of that to, to match what I had before? Like, I don't know. I don't yeah. know the answer. <laughs> and I but do the, think I like, agree with Agatha, the idea of it not being forgiven puts us in a much worse place financially than we are without it. And there are times when we think like, is it, you know, when we were, when we first were making all these decisions after a week before we had like figured out some of our logistics and before we had, um, you know, before, there was like a lull sort of like right after we closed and we're going, we should just close, like just financially speaking, like we cannot afford to be open. And then when you're taking into account that like there is a risk, anytime you leave your house, there's a risk. That was a tough decision to make, you know? Yeah. It's the... I think that this, obviously this pandemic highlights so many disparities in, in you know, our country as it is. But when you look at the food industry, I think the restaurant industry provides like some, something around 15.6 million jobs in this country. And when you look at that versus the support and the resources and the challenges that we face on a day-to-day -day basis before all of this happened in terms yeah. of you know, the economics of real estate and what people pay for rent, especially in New York City versus what our, you know, our margins are in the food industry, you know, this just highlights how difficult it was to operate before without any resources from the government. And now with all of this, it's just, it's just, it's so disheartening. And I, and I do think that, you know, there's so much more support that needs to happen for the food industry once all of this is over because you know sarah to your point the way that all of our businesses are going to operate after this is all over are going to be so drastically different than it was before you know we're looking at 
new operations and and new logistics of how to how to manage all of this and you know that in itself is costly right like you need to put in preventative measures and safety measures and those things cost money and you know for the government to say we're going to reopen the economy and everything's just going to you know be the way that it was before it's just not realistic and you know at least in terms of businesses reopening right now the government is not providing any support in terms of uh, like safety measures, right? Like yeah. at least provide businesses with masks and all of, and you know, sanitation devices and equipment to be able to make places safe for people to reopen. And that's not happening either. So. Yeah. The pieces don't fit together. <laughs> no. Yeah. You know. they don't. Um, I mean, the, uh, I mean, both of you expressed to me when we first started talking about this, that you sort of just had to be able to learn on the fly make the best out of a complicated situation and learn along the way. <clears throat> I mean, for both of you, what have been, uh, perhaps, perhaps so this is not a total bummer for everybody. I mean, um, if there has been some silver lining to this experience in terms of something that you've learned or something that you've experienced as this is happening, like what has that been? Um, me think <laughs> you're like nothing at all <laughs> just kidding just kidding i mean i think that uh it's tough i would say we've we see that we can do that that our business is flexible is a great thing that like you know we when in in the summer when it's beautiful and everybody's out we do a lot of wedding catering and so if there had been some other situation where we didn't have this space we would have been able to continue to have some income doing that you know if the problem wasn't a pandemic if it was something else and in this situation we have you know what we have we have delivery and contactless pickup and so I guess being flexible and you know Carol and my partner and I she's a, a savory chef and I'm a pastry chef and us getting into the kitchen we're here like 14 hours a day to to sort of like prop this place up and make decisions that need to be made all the time and to get all the food out you know we sort of see that like we have the the skills and we have the the like flexibility as a business to to weather different scenarios and that is heartening and also our staff you know it 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 is we're so 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 lucky that they are coming on time every day and that they are sort of showing up in support of pies and that we can support them and their families like it's it when Aga was Agatha was saying that it feels like when Ovenly was opening like it feels that way here so much too that it's like me and Carolyn for 10 hours like there are definitely a lot of laughs in that and so, it, it you know, day to, moment to moment, it doesn't feel dire. And then I go home and I go, you know, what does a sit down restaurant look like in a year? And I'm sort of like, oh yeah, this is like a, a, a very dramatic shift in this business that we've had for 14 years. I have no idea. And so that feels unusual. But but having the same people, having the same work, concentrating on finishing my pastry list every day so I can finally go home, like. So, you know, you still have those little, like, you know, joys and victories in a day. Um. I mean, one, I've always been a hustler. I think to be an entrepreneur and a small business owner, you have to be. And so, you know, just as I was scrappy when I was first starting the business, it feels like that now. Um, but, you know, to Sarah's point about just, um, like, people's resilience and uh, our staff that, you know, around all of this, my staff has been so incredible and my team has been working behind the scenes to keep this business alive in different ways. And I'm so appreciative of that and that will never change. It's, you know, it's the thing that does keep this business going and, uh, and it's something that I'm grateful for every single day. But I think also, you know, this has provided me, and I think along with other business owners, an opportunity to 
take a breath and really evaluate our business in a different way because you know we're always going right like yeah we're always moving we're always you know making sales we're always doing the things we need to do to get you know to that next level and and take those next steps in business but this has really afforded me a little bit of space to look at our business and how it's been impacted by this public health crisis and and it's given me an opportunity to say, okay, what wasn't really working before? And what were we just hanging on to because we've been doing it for so long, but you know, maybe the margins weren't quite right, or maybe it was just because we, you know, we didn't want to let it go for whatever reason. And now I'm really looking at things in a different way and saying, okay, this is a great way when we do reopen to test out some things by you know potentially removing or not resuming them and seeing what our business looks like that way and there are things that we've wanted to do but it's always hard to sort of pull the trigger and do it uh for whatever reasons but um but this is an opportunity for that and i do think a lot of businesses are going to be uh you know pivoting and and sort of reimagining what business should look look like what's meaningful after this is all over right what's meaningful to to myself as a business owner and what's meaningful to other people. And then the last thing I, I would say is that, you know, in this time that we've been shut down, we have received so much support from our customers and our fans and our neighbors and other business owners. And I, it's just, it's been so beautiful and it's what's keeping me going. It's what's keeping me and giving, keeping me alive and gi giving me hope for, when we reopen that we are going to come out of this stronger than we were before. And I do believe that we can, but it really has been um, with the help of every single person that's touched our business in different ways that um, that's made me really like look back on what we've built and, and, and feel strongly that I do want to reopen and that we can right. reopen and that it's going to be amazing when we do. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's great. I mean, that's such a, I think it has been across the board, all the people I've talked to in all these different worlds about what's happening with them. I mean, it's such a truism that it really does bring out like the best, sometimes the worst, but often the best in people. And, you know, that is, that is an amazing thing to be able to see. Um, one thing, um, I thought would be nice. It doesn't have to be in the actual interview of us talking, but maybe with the text that goes along with this, if there are any resources, um, that you would like us to point people towards, um, you know, things that have been helpful for you. Like if you, people want to find out more information, uh, or find out more information about what you're doing, or they want to donate maybe to the buckets, like, um, it would be great sure. to, uh, include that stuff. Um, uh, cause I feel like everybody is just scouring the internet in every spare second looking for something that like, you yeah. know, um, and so be, to be able to point people in the direction of like, well, here are some things that were good resources for us, you know, if yeah, you're trying to find yeah. out about this, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Most of you. Um, We've, we have one last thing about the buckets is we, one thing that we figured out when we started doing it is that hospitals are experiencing this in really different ways in, in, uh, and so we've done deliveries to a few different hospitals and we found that some of them are like, oh, you know, they, they're so happy to have it. But Woodhull really is a place that, you know, I don't know the, the logistics or finances, obviously, of the hospital, but they are a hospital in need. And so it's, you know, when we did a delivery this weekend, we did we went to them and then we had a private delivery to like a, you know, someone wanted to send her niece food at New York Presbyterian. So we delivered there and it would hold the woman that my contact there is saying, don't listen to people. It's horrible inside. Like it's not getting better. It's just as bad. And she'll call me from a closet and say, you know, is there anything you can send today? We don't have anything. I don't have anything for my doctors. And I'm going like, uh, uh, I mean, Yes, I, I can put some biscuits in the oven right now. Compared to, you know, other, we made a delivery to another hospital uptown where my friend is a volunteer. He's a radiologist, and he's, so he's volunteering on a COVID floor there. And we had trouble dropping off because there were 
so many food trucks dropping off, like, mm. you know, wow. 800 bagels and all this stuff, you know, and it's like wow. just a just salad refrigerated truck. And I'm like, I'm so glad that he is well fed. I'm so glad. Yeah. That they, you know, so I think for us, like finding that there's a, a place that's down the street that's hurting that we can actually help support, like, you know, has sort of made us being like whatever we're going through seem like we can do like a tiny thing to help and we can like stay busy on their behalf, you know? Yeah. So I would say if people want to donate to our, our bucket fund, it's that buying the buckets on our website goes straight to Woodhull. That's and great. Like, yeah. It also just shows that oftentimes the resources that are needed the most are going to, I don't want to say the wrong places, but are not getting to the places that needed them most yeah it's, it's, yes yeah yeah um, so it's awesome that you guys are doing that <laughs> yeah oh, thanks <laughs> yeah it is really it is really wonderful um i think that might be it cool. thank you thank you both so My much pleasure. for doing thank it thank you for the yeah camera. i know um yeah at some point maybe in the future we will all see each other in person <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. awesome well thanks so much guys and um yeah i'll be in touch soon Okay. okay, cool. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.